Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 17th of April, 2022. As always, if this is useful, please go ahead and like and subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notified of new content. As always, I have the chapters below in the description so you can jump to a particular update you may care about more than others. New videos this week, I created a video all about the workload identity protection service principles for our line of business applications, how I can maybe lock them down, how I can detect and react to risk on those service principles. So I, I go through that detail. And then I went into detail about the role-based access control now available on the data plane for Azure Storage. So our blobs, our queues, our tables, not having to use those access keys or shared access signatures. Now just a note about new videos, my next three weeks are insane. I have Ironman Texas in the Woodlands next week. Two weeks after that, I have Ironman St. George World Championships. And in between that, I have to do a work trip to Atlanta. So I'm still gonna make sure I get out this weekly update. It's probably gonna be from my hotel room a couple of times. Other videos, I'm just gonna do my best, but normal service will resume after that, and I've got some really cool content planned. On to the new updates. So on the compute side, we now have these VM recommended alert rules. So if we were to actually jump over to the portal, if I go and look at a virtual machine, this one's just starting up, but under monitoring you would see it, but also if I go down to monitoring alerts, we'll see this, hey, enable recommended alert rules in preview. And if we click that, it will actually show us the rules that it plans to do. So we can see there are rules around, hey, CPU is greater than a certain amount, available memory, disk IOPS, OS IOPS, we've got data and the OS disks, network throughput, and different types of notification options. So it's just gonna go and set up some basic alerts using those key metrics actually from the virtual machine. So those, if you're not sure, well maybe what are the things I care about, I can very simply now just go and enable those. Azure App Service, I can now have Java 17 and Tomcat 10.0. So those runtimes are now available as options when I'm going and creating my new app. Container apps now have managed identity support. Now the whole idea of container apps is we could deploy Azure Kubernetes service and we need a certain amount of knowledge about Kubernetes and there's configurations there. So container apps really abstract away all of the requirements of understanding Kubernetes. They give us a very easy way to deploy containers. Plus we get things like CADA for auto scaling, Dapper to aid in our microservice operations and more things like Envoy. Well, managed identity is a fantastic because I don't have to store a secret or certificate. I get an identity that's inherent to the resource. And then that identity can be given access to other resources like a database. Well, now container apps has that managed identity support. It can be a system assigned. So it's a one-to-one -one identity with a particular container app or user assigned. Where that managed identity has a separate life cycle, it can be assigned to multiple Azure resources that maybe need a common set of permissions to other resources. So I can now do that. Container apps now have health probes as well. So these are based on the underlying Kubernetes. So things like liveness, startup, readiness, TCP or HTTP, HTTPS, can now go and check and get an understanding um, of the health. And there's also a preview extension now for container apps um, for VS Code and Visual Studio. And there's also now container app metrics and alerts. This is very common across many Azure services. I want to understand the CPU, um, the memory, the network activity, the requests that my container apps are using. So I can now get visualization into those using the metrics. And because it's a metric, well, I could generate alerts off of those. Some of the common action groups I can leverage to maybe send an email or fire off a webhook, whatever that might be, I can do based on thresholds of those metrics. And then static web apps now have private endpoint support. So static web apps are fantastic where I have some pre-rendered content. Now maybe it's generated through things like Vue or Blazor or Angular, or maybe I'm just manually creating it. I have HTML, CSS, JavaScript, images, whatever it is, 
It just doesn't require any server-side processing. So now those static web apps, which are geographically distributed across multiple locations, can now be accessed using a private endpoint, which remember is an IP address in our virtual networks and any connected network. So I don't have to now have that public accessibility um, to access it, I could access it now through that private endpoint. On the networking side, DNS reservations in cloud services. So one of the challenges we can face is we create a cloud service, it gets a certain name. Hey, I get app, um, dot cloudapp.net, savilsapp.cloudapp.net. Now I delete the app. Well, I now basically lose that name, that savilapp.cloudapp.net, and someone else could come along quickly and create that name and take that name away from me, and maybe hijack what traffic was going to it. So now that DNS dangling is inhibited. Now for seven days after, I delete that cloud service, no one else can use that name, except someone in my Azure AD tenant. So it gives me time to either create a new service that I wanna use that same name for, but it stops anyone outside of my Azure AD tenant being able to reuse a name that I had and doing something malicious with it. Uh, maybe I just need that time to go and remove aliases. I had some vanity domain like savletech.com was pointing to the DNS name of that that cloud app service. Now there's a seven day reservation period. No one except something else in my Azure AD tenant could actually go and take the same name. I can now use service tags in user defined routes. So we're used to the idea of service tags, which summarize a whole set of IP addresses that relate to certain Azure services. And we use those a lot in network security groups. Hey, I'm only gonna allow access to Azure storage in East US, for example. Well, now our user-defined routes that enable me to say, well, for this destination, your next hop is maybe this virtual appliance. So I can use those same summarizations of the public IPs that reflect the different Azure services as part of my user-defined routes. I could create a route that say, hey, anything to Azure Cloud, so any Azure service, your next hop is whatever I wanna specify. On the database side, a whole bunch of things actually. So I can now reverse migrate from SQL hyperscale to the general purpose tier. So the whole point here is I, I migrated to hyperscale. I actually wanna go back again. I wanna go from hyperscale to general purpose. I have to do this within 45 days of migrating to hyperscale. If I originally created it as hyperscale, I cannot do it. It has to be, hey, I migrated to hyperscale and I'm migrating back. I can only do this reverse migration to general purpose. Um, from general purpose, I could then go business critical or something else. Azure SQL Database now supports Azure AD server principles. This was already available in SQL Managed Instance, but now I can create and use Azure AD uh, server principles for logons to that virtual master database. Azure SQL Database Backup View. When I think about Azure SQL Database, there's a whole bunch of backups that are just done for me. We have different types of falls and differentials and logs that are done at different times. What I can now do is get insight into those. So what they've done is they've created a new dynamic management view, a DMV. And there's one called sys.dm underscore database underscore backups that I can now query to see details around, well, the start time, the finish time, the type, the retention and more about all of the backups. So I can really just go and do, hey, a select star from this um, sys.dm underscore database underscore backups, and I can see the details. Azure SQL general purpose tier now has a zone redundancy option. So now when I go and create my SQL database, this could be provisioned, could be serverless, it could be elastic pool. If I go into the details of the compute and storage, there's an option to make zone redundant. So I can now get that resiliency from any kind of availability zone failure. Remember availability zones have those independent power calling networking. So it's giving me protection from some particular facility failure. The SQL migration extension has gone GA. If I think about any kind of migration, maybe from SQL Server on-premises to SQL in an ISVM, 
or maybe it's a SQL managed instance. This extension is part of the Azure Data Studio, which itself is powered by the Azure Database Migration Service. It can give me guidance through a wizard for that complete migration experience. It gives me assessment of my source database to then say, well, how suitable is this for Azure? It gives me recommendations for the right sizing of that database to really help me just get the best overall experience. So that extension has now gone GA. Cosmos DB MongoDB API Unique Index is in preview. Okay, so a unique index is really just about the idea that if I'm creating two or more documents, they can't have the same value for indexed fields. And what I can do is within the Cosmos DB, I can create a unique index, but only if the collection was empty. It didn't contain any documents. So what this feature is changing is it now gives me more flexibility. I now have the ability to create those unique indexes whenever I want to. There's no need to plan those unique indexes out in advance before I start inserting data now. So I get more flexibility when I want to actually go and create those. And then Cosmos DB Autoscale um, request units are now four times lower. When I use Cosmos DB, it's all based around request units. Hey, I use a certain amount of request units up when I do this query. If I don't pick my partition keys very well and I'm hitting lots of partitions, it might use more request units. And I might do provisioned. With provisioned, I'm saying I'm going to use a set number of request units. If I don't say enough, I get throttled. If I say too many, I'm just wasting money. So auto scale lets me get the number of request units I need based on the work that's actually happening against it. Previously, the minimum range for the auto scale was 400 to 4,000. That was the smallest value I could set. So that really impeded some of the usage of this auto scale if I, if I had a very small workload. So they have reduced that. So now that minimum range is 100 to 1,000. So it's, it's four times lower, uh, a lower cost of entry if I wanted to start leveraging auto scale. Miscellaneous is it a new look alerts page in preview. It's just easier to quickly see the alerts I have available to me when I'm looking at the alerts in the Azure portal. I can group them easier. There's now an activity log insight. So this is a workbook. I can basically go and look at Azure Monitor workbooks insight category and I see this activity log insights. So at a subscription or resource group level, I can now get this nicer view. Now I need to be sending my activity logs to a log analytics workspace, but then I'll see this new workbook and I can dive in and get an easier view of those activity logs. Log analytics has a new results set grid. But basically the idea is in the past, I might get a certain set of results from a Custo query I write against the data in my log analytics workspace. And I kind of need to understand Kusto when I want to start manipulating and see different things. Well, now with this new UI, I can actually do those changes with the data. So I pre ran a query against my database. And I'm just looking at essentially signing logs. And what we can see straight away is I have all the columns but I can now do things like filter. So I could filter based on certain values. I can also pin certain columns. I can auto size. I can group by these values. I can do in result searching. So I could actually go and search for something easily from this interface just while I'm looking at my results. I can manipulate the columns. So I can say, well, what columns do I want to see? I could drag. Um, into various groups and values. I can even pivot. So I can now pivot on certain columns based on how I want to view the data. So the whole point now is through the interface, I can very easily search, control the views, pivot, um, filter, whatever I want to do without having to know what the Custo query would be uh, to actually achieve that. So it's just going to make my life a lot easier. Windows Client now has the Azure Monitor Agent support. So the Azure Monitor Agent is the replacement for the 
the old log analytics workspace agent, the old diagnostics extension telegraph for Linux. Well, now my Windows clients, so my Windows 10, my Windows 11 can now use the AMA. It's done via an MSI, and then once I've got that MSI, it will then go and fetch the various configurations through the data collection rules, just like anything else. And the MSI is available as part of setting this up. So for example, if I was to jump over super quickly, if I just go, close that one down. If I was to go to my monitor and my data collection rules, and I just say, hey, let's create a new one, under resources, you'll notice I now have the option to download the client installer. And it even talks about Windows 10 and 11. So I'm still using data collection rules for it, but to actually get the client onto it, I download this MSI, and through that MSI file, I can then get it onto the client, and then it will go and actually start talking and use that. Now, realize it still is talking to Azure. So for these client devices, my Windows 10, my Windows 11, they do have to be Azure AD joined because I have to be able to go and get a device token for them to be able to fetch the data collection rules. So that, that's a requirement around that. Um, also, the AMA now supports custom and IIS logs. The whole goal here is any of the functionality that used to be in the old agents is coming into the Azure Monitor agent. So now custom text-based logs, my IIS logs, I can bring in. Once again, I'm gonna use a data collection rule. Everything from the AMA is a data collection rule. I'm gonna specify the file structure and the destination for that collected data. And that's it. So I hope that was useful. Again, the next few weeks are gonna be hectic for me. A couple of these weekly updates will be likely from a hotel room in and the Woodlands and then St. George, but I'll still make sure I get these out and I'll try and create some extra content as best I can. But service will resume after the St. George Ironman. Until the next video, take care.